Hi everyone, my name is Lisa and thank you for coming today. I'm very excited to present to you all. I didn't realize almost everyone here is an Android developer. I actually don't have much experience in Android development. But since M is mostly a mobile web app, I think that will be applicable for everyone. So a little bit about me, I started off as a financial analyst and turned digital marketer and now full stack engineer. And I've lived and worked in three different continents, primarily Asia, Africa, as well as the United States, so North America. Um, with that, I've had some experience using some very basic budget Android phones and actually had to buy month-to-month -month data measured in megabytes and gigabytes, which was a new thing for me when I first arrived in South Africa. So I think that gives me some interesting perspective. Whoa, sorry. Some interesting perspective. And now that the slides are gone. Sorry, give me one second. Aha. OK. I'm just going to have to keep my finger on so it doesn't sleep. <laughs> anyway, so it gives me some interesting perspective as a mobile user as well as a mobile div. And I first discovered AMP actually through an SEO course on front end masters. So today I want to tell you a little bit about AMP. Just to get a show of hands, has anyone heard of AMP before? Okay, has anyone built an AMP page before? Great, you're the perfect audience. No one's gonna correct me, which is always nice. <laughs> <laughs> so AMP is actually an open source project initiated by Google. And it creates, it, the goal or the mission of it is to create instantly loading lightning fast web apps. And over the last two years, it was launched first in 2015, there's actually over 2 billion AMP pages right now running in the wild, spread across 900,000 domains and over 100 plus languages. So that's quite a huge uptake for a project that has only been around for two years. A lot of the core contributors are Googlers, but you're seeing more and more people from Airbnb or eBay or just some of the other companies that are using it. And as of May this year, um, Google announced that AMP is going to be launched, well actually it has been launched, to every single Google Chrome app around the world, and you've probably seen it if you've used a Google search before. Let me see if the video is showing. Okay. So if you've searched on Google on your mobile before, you've probably seen this top stories carousel. That's actually an AMP feature, and it's now launched in Google Chrome over the world. So if you're on your Android phones and also use Chrome, you've probably seen it. And some of the content platforms that AMP is working on. So you have anything from the big guys, Google, Medium, Pinterest, Twitter, as well as more user-generated platforms like Drupal and WordPress. And what this actually means for you as a developer is that if you're building AMP pages, your content is immediately optimized across all these different platforms. And this is just a subset. There's a lot more platforms, probably around, I can't remember, 100 plus on your website. So please go take a look. And you can see here on LinkedIn, um, this is the LinkedIn mobile app. That little circle, I'm not sure if you can see, there's a little light, lightning bolt kind of symbol that shows it's an AMP page. And if you're on Google and you search, and now that you notice at the bottom of your search results, you'll actually see AMP page noted on it. So. After you click on it, it loads within literally two seconds. So it's a really fast instant loading experience for users. And who uses AMP today? So I know frameworks come and go, repos come and go, especially open source when you're not sure how reliant they are. And kind of one of the things that I was worried about initially was how, who are using AMP today? Is it reliable? Can we have confidence to adopt it? As, as you can see, there's a lot of big companies up here. As far as in the UK, I think both Guardian and BBC, as well as some of the other major publications, do use AMP pages as well. So you can definitely feel confident going forward. Again, it's been around two years, and I know from a, the Google's perspective, they actually make an active effort promoting it, as well as in Google I.O. and other events. So there's definitely a lot of support around it. So the most recent development, again, this happened in May, just two months, well, a month ago. And before when you're using or seeing an end page, chances are you experience this mostly with news publishers or anything that's very static, static websites. And right, they announced that there's a huge move into making more interactive content and user interactivity. And they are expanding into sectors like e-commerce and travel and retail. 
So that's something where AMP is moving from static websites to something that we're more familiar with, with user interactivity. And they actually talk about moving to progressive web app as well. So we'll talk a little about that towards the end of the day. So today I want to talk about three mobile web challenges you may face as a mobile div, whether you are building native app or web apps, as well as AMP's approaches to how they conquer these challenges or how they deal with these challenges. And we're actually going to do some coding at the end and build a very simple AMP app together. So the first challenge is that most devices are not powerful. And I think as developers, a lot of the time we play with some of the most cutting edge or the newest devices, because that's something that's very exciting. But chances are most of your users are not on the latest Samsung, or not on the latest Android phones or iOS phones. Second so issue or challenge is that cellular networks are very slow. And building for web app, as you know, is very different from building for something on Wi-Fi or a desktop app. And finally, JavaScript is doing all the heavy lifting. Again, you've probably heard of different frameworks, like um, I think from a JavaScript perspective, Angular, React, Ember, Meteor is getting more popular, and some of the other ones. So they're doing a lot of work for us. So the first challenge, where most devices are not powerful, how many of you know these companies? Everyone, right? It's the third one. Oh, the third one. I don't know. <laughs> Funny enough, they are super popular in Africa because they have a focus on budget film now. And I think since it's been bought out, there's actually a lot of blackberries running around. And when I was working in corporate in South Africa, all the company phones are still blackberry. And that's in the last two years. That's not like seven years ago. So it's still around. How many of you know about these other app? These other companies? Yeah? Very nice. That's pretty good. Uh, the last time I gave this talk was in Madrid to the Google Development Group. Most people have not seen the other Android phones. So where does the slow performance come from when you're using a phone that's not as powerful? Something from complex CSS animations to playing a video where it's constantly re-rendering and recalculating layout and painting on screen to anything that's running in the background from very popular web workers or service workers that's now happening on the browser to push notification, GPS, anything that requires data download and data parsing. All of that requires a lot of CPU as well as just energy, and that's why your phone heat up. So let's look at a case study. Um, you're going to see that little white ball move to the right of the screen. First, we're going to use something basic like setting a loop and changing the left position of this white circle. And you can see that it's moving very janky because it's doing a lot of re-layout calculation, and it's taking the text with it all the way off the screen, right? Not the experience you want your user to have. And this experience is not desirable at all. So how do you enforce it on per web page when you're building an app to ensure that none of these animation issues happen on your apps? What's happening here is the JavaScript is defining the style. There's re-layout calculations, repainting on the screen, and finally compositing on the screen. So let's look at a second example where we're using CSS animation and just using transform with shifting the x-axis. As you can see, it is much smoother because this is actually GPU optimized and also it does not trigger any layout recalculations. You're skipping two of the steps, the layout and the paint, and just compositing when necessary. This is something that will conserve the power of your user's phone and again, optimize the experience. So what's AMP's approach to complex CSS animations and anything else that will suck up all the power on your user low end phones? They use a very subset of CSS. In fact, they only allow 50 KB of CSS, which is not a lot once you're used to using SAS and all these other big frameworks. And with animation, only GPU accelerated properties are permitted. So for example, you can use transform, like we saw in the last case study, as well as opacity changes. Again, the goal is to skip the layout and the painting, and you can go to CSS triggers to identify which CSS functions qualify for these. They also use, they go a step further and use something called the AMP, uh, the AMP custom component. And with the custom components, it's a little different from what you're used to. The image tag, it's gone. <laughs> We're using AMP image. 
And why they're coming up with these custom components is because of the additional feature or ability provides. For example, in AMP image or AMP video, you have to specify a fixed height and width of your element. And you have to include a placeholder and a fallback and even something called a source set. Why? Because if a page, by parsing your HTML, will know exactly how the layout of the page is going to look like, they only need to render it once. You don't have to recalculate your layout, and that saves the time from painting and compositing as well. We'll see some example of how this comes in handy in the next one. So the second challenge we see is that cellular networks make connections very slowly. Why is it slow to initiate a network connection? Why does it cost extra when you're making an extra call to your server to download a different file? Well, that's because these are the rough speed it will take on different connections. And here you'll see that there's actually a fixed cost to the left. So initially, when a user goes to a new website, there's a DNS lookup, TCP connection, as well as an HTTP request and any of the SSL handshakes. That's going to take at least 600 milliseconds, and that's on a reliable 3G connection. So now add in your server response time, even if it's very fast. That's due 200 milliseconds. And then you have client-side rendering, which means that regardless of what you do, no matter how fast your server is and how great your client-side rendering tactics are, there's still a minimum requirement of 600 milliseconds. That's something you can avoid. That's a fixed cost. Now imagine a 2G network or anything that's even slower. So many network requests. Um, on one of the research, it shows that over 50% of pages have more than 76 requests. That's downloading external script. That's downloading external CSS files. That's downloading resources like image and video, web fonts. You've probably all used some of those. And with these large number of requests, right, they're really blocking up the critical path as far as when your user downloads a page to when they finally see a meaningful paint on the web page. CSS is an external style sheet we spoke about. Um, the multi-step process we spoke about. And finally, the seller provider round robin. Um, I'm not quite sure, depending on if you're using Vodafone or some of the, I think, British telecom, some of the other telecom providers, there may be something called a round robin, which means when you are standing somewhere, the cell towers around you take turns around robin to process your request. Now imagine if you're in somewhere very busy, like a conference or a festival, or if you're traveling during peak time on traffic. Those will influence the amount of time a cellular tower is assigned to you. And that's before the process even begins with DNS and SSL and TCP. So let's look at an example of K, um, Adobe website, the Adobe blog. And um, the test was on good 2G speed on a Motorola Gen 4. So pretty reliable phone and OK connection. It took 18.5 seconds before you see anything meaningful on the screen. And you can see between 18 and 20 seconds, it's downloading some background image slowly. And we use that a lot. And then up to 37.5 seconds, the image was still downloading. And now something weird happened. The text disappeared. Does anyone know why text disappeared? your web phone downloaded. So it's re-rendering. Congratulations, your user have lost all text, even if they're halfway through the page. And now you see that at 50 seconds, the title actually re-rendered. The layout is different. So chances are another web phone downloaded just for the title. So how does AMP approach this issue of slow connections as well as a large number of requests? Well, firstly, they're using something called an AMP cache. Effectively, it's storing all the data once a user has visited on the Google cache or the Google domain. And because chances are most of your users have probably used Google to search at one point or another. So they're saving you all that initial time. When someone is loading your web page, they don't need to find the domain. They don't need to go and do an SSL handshake because they know Google. They have used Google before. So it's saving you that portion of time. And also, they might implement further um, optimizations to make the cache even faster, which means serving up your web app at a much greater speed. So another approach it does is inline CSS. So we talk about how CSS style sheet is an extra request back and forth. With AMP, you have to inline your style sheet. Again, maximum 50 kilobytes. And you can see here with your style tab, we've actually added the word AMP custom. 
so you can in inline of your style sheet. And what that means is when you have a single page app, instead of downloading three things, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right after the first request, where you request the HTML, it has a CSS styling. So it provides a good basic user experience for your user when they arrive at your page. Another approach actually has three different things. It's resource prioritization, prefetching, and lazy loading. So what it means is when someone is on your web app, and actually analyze, again, with those calculations of how high or how wide your resources are, what's above the fold, which is what's initially on your first screen. And those resources are prioritized, i.e. download any video, download any images. Resources are prefetched, so anything beneath the fold, beneath the screen. It will still be downloaded concurrently in the background, but you will only be lazy loaded, which means you will only be loaded once your user starts scrolling that page and get to the resource it needs to. So that's saving you some CPU resource as well. I know I'm going very fast. <laughs> Let me know if I need to slow down. Um, the third challenge we face is JavaScript doing all the heavy lifting. You've probably seen some of these frameworks and used some of them. Um, there's gaining, I guess there's popularity now in making it faster and smaller. So you're seeing that with React, there's Preact. With Ember, there's Glimmer. So different frameworks are now launching a smaller, more modular framework to help to speed that up. They're still pretty heavy. So where does the slow come from? When you're downloading an external framework, like the entire React or the entire Ember, that's a script request, which means that you have to make that extra additional network request to download just the framework JavaScript itself. There's another thing where in the browser, it's typically synchronous JavaScript. That means that when it's parsing your HTML and sees a script, it needs to pause everything it's doing and go and download the file. Only when the file is completed does it continue to parse through the HTML. So now imagine if you have multiple files, it's going to go through all that before the page loads. Parsing the JavaScript once it's downloaded will take time as well. And if there is additional script, it's making the round trips again. So finally, when you arrive at the first meaningful paint or the first meaningful interactivity, it may be 20, 30 seconds in, like what we saw with Adobe. So server-side rendering is something that everyone's talking about now, and it's supposed to help, but it's really difficult, and it's really complicated. So if, even if you're moving towards server-side rendering, there's still a lot of knobs you need to twist to actually get that correct. So now let's look at Apple, right? So we're just loading the apple.com website, decent good 3G connection and with a 10 times CPU slowdown. So we're mimicking a very slow, more basic Android or iOS phones. And you see that, firstly, we downloaded the HTML page. Nothing's on the screen yet. We downloaded the CSS style sheet. Okay, we see some styling, there's nav bar. But because your JavaScript's not downloaded, chances are if you click on that hamburger menu, nothing's gonna happen. Finally, JavaScript's still downloading. We have one image that's downloaded. It's beneath the fold, so I have no idea why it is. And finally, it's downloaded. So we see that the, I guess, the hero image on the top, as well as JavaScript. So Apple could have probably benefited by having the source set function of that image up top, and seeing that if you're using a small phone with a small screen to only serve up something with low resolution, as opposed to something with retina resolution with your retina screen. So how does AMP approach this issue, right? How does it approach this heavy JavaScript, heavy lifting? Firstly, they change off your JavaScript scripts to a sync, a synchronous instead of synchronous. And what that means is um, any of your resources can be downloaded concurrently. When HTML passes and it sees a script, instead of going, download, coming back, pause, it can just download multiple resources at the same time without that holding up your critical path. Another thing AMP is doing is actually using something already in your browser, the sandbox iframe. What a sandbox iframe does is it limits all of your JavaScript, whether that be a framework or any external plugins, inside an iframe. This iframe will still render on your screen or your page. So the user doesn't actually feel any difference in their experience, but what that means is it's better for your web security because if anyone injects a script, you'll be kept in that iframe and it wouldn't affect anything outside. If there's any automatic trigger features like a video, autoplay, it would be kept within the iframe. 
And also, within the iframe, you have to define a width and a height, so you wouldn't see that page re-rendering or re-layout when you load it. So now we're going to do some live coding, and it's actually a recorded video, so I'm not actually going to live code because internet connection and whatnot. We're going to build a Corgi adoption app with AMP. And as you can see here, we have a video. We have a light box image where once you click on it, you get a light box, as well as a menu to allow some user interactivity. So let's get into it. All right. Oh. Yeah, OK. Sorry. Let me get started again. OK, so this is a pretty basic HTML code, as you can imagine. There's the doc type, the head, some meta, title, body with an h1 tag. It's pretty straightforward, right? So if you're using or if you're developing using Google Chrome, you can download a plugin for AMP, an AMP plugin. And that was actually an older feature. Now if you just use the developer console, it will render any errors. So you don't actually have to rely on the plugin anymore. And first thing, we click on the plugin. We see that there's five different errors to make your HTML app an AMP app. So we're just going to go through it. So first thing we do is we added something called a canonical URL. And what this means is the true content or the true link to your website. So for example, the question I get is, but we have a progressive web app. It's a React app. Are you telling me to tear it all down, to change it into AMP? That's stupid. No, you don't have to do it. When you build an AMP page, think of it as a landing page. But you can refer back to this canonical URL to your progressive web app, whether that be React, Angular, Ember. What that means is that the first arrival, when your user is downloading your website for the first time, that landing page is going to be super fast, because it's AMP. And you have a service worker, it's downloading the background, it's caching all the data. When the user return again, you'll be directed to the progressive web app. It wouldn't come back to AMP. So you get the speed as well as the value of your PWA. So that's the first link we did, we added. And now we refresh. There's actually only three errors left. So you just needed to add a canonical URL and you have halfway there. All right, second thing we're going to do is we're adding a style boilerplate. So this is like any other CSS boilerplate, just regulating your style. And there's a no script element for any backup in case your user has disabled JavaScript altogether. So now you can see that the little circle on the top right screen, which means all of your errors have been resolved. You now have an end page. That's all you needed. Second thing we're going to do is I'm just adding some content. So we have an H1 tag and a P tag. And then now we're going to, I think I, I'm going to add a video. Yes, I'm adding a video. <laughs> I'm adding a YouTube video. So you're trying to build an adoption, Corgi adoption website. And you want to show the cute video of how cute these puppies are. So people will come by. So first thing we did was we just download, um, copy and pasted the script to AMP YouTube, the custom component, and that was pasted up here. And then you just build the AMP YouTube component, which is pretty straightforward. You can see that we opened with AMP YouTube. And then um, with the layout, you just set layout to be responsive. So it automatically fits your port or your um, viewing port. And then there's a data video ID, which is just something on your YouTube video. Um, you define the width, you define the height, and you can use autoplay as an attribute so that the video autoplay. And as you can see, once you refresh the page, the video plays the moment the page is downloaded. And there's very cute puppies. And it's still green, so there's still no AMP error. Just doing a clear. Next, this is slightly more convoluted. We're going to add an image um, as well as a light box, a light box effect. So first thing we did was we, again, just copy and paste the script to AMP image and AMP image light box. Those are the custom components. And we're actually going to do a couple things. Firstly, I'm wrapping the whole thing in a figure. I'm wrapping in figure because I'm going to add a caption to this light box when it's open later. And then with AMP image, you just close AMP image and um, open and close with AMP image. You add an on, so that's actually just an event listener through CSS. So you're saying on tap, the light box will open. So the role of it, it's a button, which means when you click on this image, it's serving as a button, and the layout will be responsive, again, to fit the size of the screen. Um, tab index, we're adding that for Araya accessibilities. And again, you're defining the width and the height of this image. 
And I'm adding this as a serial source, which you'll know what that is. And if you've heard of Place Kitten, I'm much more of a corgi person, so place corgi all the way. <laughs> Same idea, you just add the width and height. Um, alternative, as, and that's again for Araya, so you get that image read out, and you add a title, again, for accessibility. And these are optional, but obviously for accessibility, which are all added. And after this, let's see what I did. Aha, so I'm just going to create a div here and have a fallback. So fallback is an attribute. What this means is um, if place corgi is down and the image is not available, it's just going to render a gray box. And on the gray box, it's going to say offline. So you have this placeholder built in. And then you close with the image, and you have your figure caption. And in the figure caption, I'm just calling it I'm a cute corgi. And you will see that once the light box opens. Oh, yeah, I made an error with the width and the height, so I'm just going to correct that. And finally, outside of that figure, which is just an image along with a caption, I'm adding emp image lightbox. So that's a custom component. And I'm giving it an ID, lightbox1, which is related to that on event listener earlier on, on tap. You will open lightbox1. So now, if you refresh, you have that video, autoplay, you scroll down, there's an image, and there's your figure caption and the lightbox effect. All right, so that's that. So I think next up, um, I'm going to add some social share functions because I want people to tell their friends and family so they'll come and adopt some corgis. Again, you just copy and paste it. Oh, sorry, it's further up. <laughs> copy and paste the script. And with social share, I'm wrapping it in a div just for styling reasons later, centering and such. Again, you just open with amp social share and close with amp social share. The nice thing with this custom component is it has all the image of the different social network your email, your Facebook, your YouTube, your Twitter, etc. So you don't have to go and find a favicon yourself. So you just define the type. Um, data param app ID is just something Facebook did use, so you probably have that. Um, with Twitter, we're adding a data param text, which we'll see later. What that means is when you click on the Twitter image to share, that text will auto-populate in the share function. So they call it data param text. Again, you save it, you refresh, it's too green. Now you see your social share buttons on the bottom. You click Twitter, and there it is. You have the text, and you see that there's an URL populated. That defaults to your canonical URL. So if someone shares it, they're going to come to your PWA, if you define that. Or if you want to link it to your AMP website, just, in, just change it. You don't have to use the default. All right, so lastly, I think I'm adding some interactivity. OK, I'm adding the AMP sidebar, so your hamburger menu bar which you're probably quite familiar with. Um, so we copy and pasted the script. It's up there now. It's called emp sidebar. And then we are putting that on the top because we want it above the H1 title. And firstly, I'm creating a button, right? When you're clicking on the menu, there's a menu button. And once you click on it, your menu will display. So again, you have an event listener on tap to toggle your sidebar and class for styling reasons. So once you have the button, there we go, we are just going to start creating the AMP sidebar. Again, you open with AMP sidebar and you close, and that's an ID. It's a typo. You will get corrected. And um, from here, again, you can set the layout to be responsive or non-display in this case, because you don't want the menu bar to be on display the moment someone arrives at your app. You want them to click on the button. With the side, you can choose left or right of your screen. Um, the width, you can use pixels or viewport width. And here, I'm adding another button for closing that menu bar. Again, you see the on tap and the toggle effect. And then finally, we're just going to add about and the adoption page. And that should be that. OK, so we save it. Oh, correct the typo. We save it, and then we refresh, and you should see a nav bar on the top. There you go, a menu and a toggle. So you start having some user, um, user interactivity as well as animations that's appearing now. So finally, um, I'm just adding some custom styling. And basically, you open with style. Oh, sorry, I copy and pasted, but style and amp dash custom. And you get that inline CSS style sheet. So now you have some styles, the menu, background's yellow. And you start scrolling up and down. Oh, with the video, you'll see that once it's auto-playing, if um, user navigate away from it, then the video will pause 
as well. So those are all some of the freebies you get with the M Custom component, and they're pretty good documentation as well as tutorial, so you can get up to speed quite quickly. Again, as a recap, three challenges. So what happens if the device is not powerful enough? You use a limit set of CSS animations as well as HTMLs. Uh, when the cellular network is much slower, you can defer some of these efforts. And finally, with JavaScript, again, moving into sandbox iframes as well as using your inlining, that can defer the effort of having to download an entire framework before loading your first page. How am I doing on time? <laughs> Yeah, you're okay. Okay, good. Perfect. So, um, progressive web app, just some of the future development that's currently in place. Of course, you can use Service Worker or no Service Worker. And Empress Progressive Web App, they have now implemented Service Worker as a custom component. So, remember how we said in EMP you have to use a sandbox iframe for any of your external JavaScripts? Basically, with a Service Worker, you can inject other scripts and pretty much you know upgrade your M page to something more of a progressive and here you can just do install service workers and it will do it from origin which is where your canonical URL is again if you have a progressive app just use that and when someone arrives at your page and they've already have the service worker downloaded in the background you will intercept that request and redirect them so it's something called shell URL rewriting or shell script writing read more about that. I haven't figured all that part out yet. MP and PWA, this is something which I thought was interesting. Um, again, going back to the idea of having a really fast landing page, but having the rich features of a progressive web app, um, they're proposing to start using MP almost as a modular unit to be content or content backend of your website. So again, you can mix and play if you have a blog that's one of your inbound marketing thing where you let people go through and the idea is to expose them to your company. Maybe have AMP for of your static data, so it's modular. And then when you have more interactivity or if you have more service and login element, redirect them to your progressive web app. So you can divide that up and do it more modularly. And finally, ah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And please let me know if you have uh, any questions. I guess we have five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay.